Good afternoon. Hi. We want to go ahead and get started. We've seen that most people are moving closer toward dessert. As, as we did yesterday, I want to ask you to try to, those that, that are spend, taking the opportunity to network and talk with others and need a little more time to eat, um, I will go first. Hopefully, uh, you'll be done by the time Dr. Melendez is ready. <laughs> Um, again, I want to thank all of you for the hard work that you've put into the last two days. We opened by saying that you get in what you, or you get out of this meeting what you put into it, and we can clearly say, looking in all the different breakout rooms, that people have gotten a lot out of the meeting. Um, we're not done. There's some uh, really good sessions that will take place in the afternoon, followed by opportunities for additional team meetings. But we also recognize that with the difficulties of travel lately, that people start to leave when the airplanes fly. Uh, and uh, the good news is we're really close to the, ho the airport. Um, the shuttle runs every 20 minutes on the, starting on the hour, and it's pretty fast. It's about a 10-minute ride to the airport, so we're hoping that you can stay with us as long as possible if you have an earlier flight. We're also, if we can finish this session, we're going to slide the... the um, the schedule slightly uh, to accom you know to start things a little bit early. We'll just start the next session as soon as we finish with uh, bringing some closure in the large room. But this is not a signal that you're free to play hooky or skip the session, the, ne the upcoming sessions, um, if, unless you have an airplane ticket. If you have to show us your ticket, <laughs> or, or you're going to be in trouble. Um, I do want to officially clarify, by the way, because Dr. Mel uh, Melendez is here that we did the hotel and the lunch are all following GSA guidelines or as close as possible to government rate. This is not, we're not eating steak because we're being extravagant. We're eating steak because the hotel gave us a good deal. <laughs> Um, because we all put our money toward turning around schools and uh, doing what's good for kids. Um, so I just wanted to summarize with a few things about moving forward. I, I want to reemphasize we keep talking about the website. It's part of the, it's housed within the high school center's website, but that's the, the, what you see on the screen and what is in your book, uh, your program, is the site where you can get all of the PowerPoints, you can get all of the handouts that were referenced, and hopefully within a week or so you can get the audios from the different sessions that you either attended or what were unable to attend and were interested in getting some information. I know Carlos and John did a great job answering questions, but a few more might uh, this morning during breakfast, um, but a few more might pop up. We encourage you to use the, the department's website, sigquestions at ed.gov, and I want to thank the half a dozen or so folks who were, Twitter, were tweeting throughout the meeting. We, we've been looking at the Twitter feeds, and we'll be making them available. Um, I also want to reference on your table is a, a, a few copies of a card from the high school school center that has our email address and also our social network sites. Um, we do have a blog that we publish information about high school reform and reference reports and things that's going, not only going on with the department but uh, with other uh, organizations that are promoting high school reform. So we hope you'll start visiting our blog on a regular basis because all of this, including everything we've been talking about, we've been talking about the start of a high school reform network or high school improvement network that goes beyond this, this meeting. We've also indicated to you that we recognize that we covered a lot of information um, very broadly and that now is the challenge of going deeper in some of those areas. The way that you can help us uh, decide what those areas and make those recommendations to the department is to make sure you fill out the evaluation form, give us some feedback on speakers that you'd like more information or more opportunities to interact with, and then there is the on the blue paper the survey that also includes um, 
on the, the opportunity for you to identify your availability and interest in different types of forums like webinars, like uh, di uh, meetings, like, uh, you know, like uh, PLCs or communities of practice. The department is going to independently also be launching some K-12 communities of practice around uh, SIG and so giving us information about what you think are the interest priorities, which is on the back of the, the, the same blue sheet, is information that we will share with the department so they can prioritize not only the use of our resources, but the other resources that they're going to be committing. Um, I want to call your attention to... Uh, excuse me, on your seats, you should have seen uh, a handbook called the Handbook on Effective Implementation of School Improvement Grants. This is a document that was edited by the Center of Inno Innovation and Improvement, but it, it, was, it was really authored by all the content centers, the five content centers we've discussed, that contributed uh, the identification of not only our own resources, but other resources that we think are germane to the different topics areas. Uh, this is also available online if you don't have room in your luggage. Um, but it's a great resource that we want to call your attention to. And again, I want to uh, uh, encourage all of you, depending on your level, if you're at this uh, school and district level, want to encourage you to ask for additional TA through your states. Your states then can in turn work with the regional comprehensive center network and the content centers work directly with the regional comprehensive centers in providing assistance and helping states provide additional resources. Um, so there's a kind of a chain that we go through, but all of our websites, all the content center websites are available to you directly. The high school center's website's pretty easy to remember. Remember, it's betterhighschools.org. You can get access to all the different things I've discussed today through that direct address. Um, you can pull down some of our resources. I know Sabrina mentioned some of the TQ Center resources earlier today. The high school center uh, resources, and one I want to really encourage you to look at is our early warning system tool, which is a free tool for identifying and flagging students, especially ninth and tenth graders who are at risk of dropout. Um, Hopefully, you've been actualizing what we said from the start, which is this is the meetings of not only about looking and understanding what's out there and hopefully getting some new knowledge, but about making new contacts, building new relationships, and we hope that you'll continue. I want to remind everybody that at the very end of the program is the email address of just about everybody who's been here. Um, so you don't need to have, walk away with lots of business cards, or if you didn't get lots of business cards, you have a way to get, it, to get in touch with everybody. It starts on page 43. There were so many people that we couldn't list any other uh, information besides who you are, where you're from, and what your email address is. And we will follow up with those that indicate on the survey by giving us your email address that you want to continue to communicate. Uh, there are some additional resources from the reception uh, last night if you weren't able to attend the resource reception available as well. And again, we really need the, the TAN evaluation form. So I can't think of a better way to uh, bring closure to the meeting than to invite one of the, the, the person who's responsible for us being here, and that's Dr. Thelma Melendez. And uh, as I mentioned with Carl, you can read her very interesting biography of how she got to where she is, but I can cut to the chase and say, again, she's a former superintendent of Pomona who walked the walk and worked very hard on school reform and has brought that energy to the department and has said from day one it's about helping schools and districts and helping states help schools and districts. And so she's the one that about six months ago said we've got to have additional help on SIG and we want to encourage her to uh, encourage and get that help as quickly as possible. So I'm pleased, I'm pleased to to introduce uh, Dr. Melendez. I don't know why the lights have darkened, but uh, if you don't mind, do you want more? 
We'll see if we can get them turned up a little bit. Thank you. I know it's sort of like the atmosphere, the sort of the, the the look of the hotel. But when you're over a certain age, you need a little bit more light, you know. So. Um, to look good or to see well. <laughs> Joe says to look good or to see well. <laughs> You know, it's, it's really a, a pleasure uh, to be here today and, and, and to be here with you. Uh, first of all, I just want to acknowledge the wonderful work that Joe Harris and his team has done in putting together this amazing conference. I, 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 I can tell you, even looking at the way that this was organized, the details have just been incredible. You know, to the email uh, listing at the end. I mean, he's thought of everything. Your team and you have done an amazing job of, uh, oops. Getting darker. Uh, an amazing job of, of pulling this uh, conference together. And, and you know, um, every once in a while, and, and I, I'm glad Joe mentioned that, you know, this is at government rate, but, you know, it really makes people feel great as professionals when you're treated as professionals. And, you know, Joe, thank you. Thank you very much for, for that. And, you know, the document that you received, that actually won an award at AERA for Document of the Year. And, uh, you know, it was wonderful that the, the comprehensive centers worked together, that Dr. Redding and his team uh, sort of spearheaded it, but everybody was engaged. And we saw it as a very important resource for all of you to have. So, again, I want to uh, thank uh, Joe and his team and all the partners that are here today. Uh, for, and uh, I'd like to start off by just um, giving an overview of what I'm going to share with, uh, with you today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why turnarounds are essential. And, and turnaround in the broadest sense, not the turnaround model, but turnarounds in the broadest sense. I'm going to talk about some myths then I'm going to talk about our uh, new TA initiative that we're working on in the Office of Elementary and Secondary, and it's actually um, happening at the department as well. And then I'm going to end with a call to leadership uh, for, for all of us. Um, and I, I may be speaking to people, I mean, I may be preaching to the choir here, but I, I think it's always important to remember uh, how important our work is. So I know, um, but before I get started, I think you've met most of the department people that are here, but I want to acknowledge uh, our team. Uh, you know, Elizabeth Grant, Liz Grant is here in the front, John White. Did you all, did you all see me, Liz? <laughs> so if you have any questions, and John White's here, Carlos, I, that you all know, McCulley's back there, and then uh, Stephanie Sproul. And, and, you know, Stephanie, when she and I worked together, um, every time I'd come to Chicago, I, I'd... I remember to bring her some Garrett's popcorn. So as you leave at the airport, don't forget to grab some. Good, delicious, yes. Greg, where's Greg? Oh, there's Greg. Greg Darneter also. Um, he works at the office of the secretary is here. Anybody else that I'm missing from the... Yeah. Braden, where's Braden? Where... Okay. He's been here. Okay. So Braden works with us in the Office of Elementary and Secondary Ed. You know, our agenda has been uh, rich in opportunities to highlight effective practices, tackle obstacles, and explore specific solutions for high school re reform. It's really exciting uh, and inspiring to see such a diverse group focused on sharing a goal. And that goal is building diverse is, is building vibrant learning communities for our students, for our young people. And this, to me, is the toughest work, the work that you're engaged in at the secondary level. When you return home, our hope is that you'll have more tools than ever before to support transformational change and increase student achievement. I want to um, acknowledge the presenters and uh, those of you that participated and, and, and gave time, if we can just give them a hand for all the presenters who, who came. What I loved about the conference is that it was really a mix of, 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 um, of different types of experts. 
you know, uh, people who have done a lot of research in this area, people who work at state level, and then you have people who are experts because they're doing it every single day in schools and they've been successful. And that, uh, I think, was a wonderful, wonderful mix that, that I, I saw in this conference. But most of all, though, I want to thank all of our SIG grantees for being willing to put aside every other consideration and to put our children first. By taking this stand for the next generation, you're serving as moral leaders and educational leaders. We recognize that giving and providing an excellent education to every child is a moral and civic imperative as well as an economic one. Our continued successes in the United States depend on how well we prepare our children for the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. There you go. <laughs> uh, John F. Kennedy, and um, actually we're celebrating uh, 50 years of his uh, inauguration this last January. Um, he described our challenge in, in education this way, as uh, our challenge in education and as educators this way. He said, let us think of education as a means of developing our greatest abilities because in each of us there is a private hope and a dream which fulfilled can be translated into benefit for everyone and greater strength for our nation. By helping students to develop their abilities and achieve their dreams, good schools and great teachers and leaders not only enrich individual lives, but strengthen whole communities and they strengthen an entire nation. These values have a greater urgency today as we face challenges and opportunities of a global economy and a flattened world that demands greater competitiveness and greater collaboration from today's students. And I, I have a little personal story around, around this quote in this, uh, in this slide. Um, President Obama uh, gave this quote actually to, it, as part of his State of the Union speech, but he also gave it in his speech uh, to Miami Central High School, where he um, went to visit a SIG high school, uh, walked around some of the classrooms, engaged with the students, and I'll tell you a little, little secret. It was um, a wonderful opportunity for me because I got to ride an Air Force One. <laughs> and that was amazing. <laughs> so, um, but what was, what was astounding for me was to see uh, the president uh, interact with students. When I was superintendent of the Pomona uh, Unified School District, um, what some of our high school students, uh, I don't know if you heard of this video, they put together a video called, Is Anyone Listening? In that video, they talked about, from a student's perspective, how this financial crisis was affecting them. And as, as educators in the school system, you know, teachers, the principal, myself, we had no idea how this crisis was really impacting their lives. And in this, this video, they expressed, you know, from, you know, how it hurts to see that there's no food in the house and that, you know, uh, one student said he wouldn't eat so his younger brother could eat. And so that DVD somehow got into the hands of the White House. And this is actually, I was already going through vetting. So the president mentioned uh, one of our students in, in our schools in his first speech on education. And he talked about, you know, is anyone listening? He says, I'm listening. I'm listening. Well, about two months later, he comes to Pomona and as he's going through Los Angeles, and he meets with the group of students that uh, created this DVD. And it was fascinating to see um, his interaction and his caring manner with them. I saw the very same thing at uh, Miami-Dade Central uh, with the students. So when he says education is a key to maintaining America's leadership role, we have to win the race to educate our children. That's why, right after taking office, he issued a challenge to all of us, and I'm sure you all know that, by 2020, the U.S. will once again, once again lead the world in college completion, which we are currently tied for ninth. The President says that the most important contest we face today is the work of winning the future by out-innovating, out-educating, and out-building the rest of the world. Winning the future means ensuring that all of our students graduate from high school ready for college and careers. And this administration, the President, Secretary Duncan, and all of us at the Department of Education have made the commitment to turning around America's lowest performing schools as a centerpiece of our cradle to career reform agenda. 
we back this commitment with unprecedented resources, $4 billion. So the schools are receiving, if you multiply the, the $2 million max, I mean, that's about $4 billion for Title I uh, SIG grants. And through our blueprint, uh, ESEA reauthorization uh, reform, our annual budget request, we continue to support this type of reform. As the newly revitalized SIG program makes it clear, it's time for daring reforms, not timid tinkering. Our children, our children can't wait. The work you're undertaking is far from easy, and I know, I've been there. Training around low-performing schools is about so much more than simply school improvement. Reimagining America's high schools is a radical endeavor that calls for daily dedication and difficult decisions. All of you are groundbreakers and pathmakers for hundreds of other schools that will follow in your footsteps. Uh, Joe shared how he opened this conference. And to me, it's, it's very, very telling that we really haven't changed much, have we? We really haven't changed much. And what we offer our students, the programs, the instruction. And so this is an opportunity that we're all investing in, in supporting you to make those changes. You are the pioneers working to prove that we can achieve the large-scale transformation we seek. Already we're beginning to see results in communities all across the country, and thus far our almost 1,000 SIG schools have joined in this important work. So let's make sure we take time today to celebrate our progress recognizing promising practices and reaffirm our commitment to success. I want to talk about myths. Um, this past year, um, actually in the summer, uh, Secretary Duncan uh, spoke at the College Board AP conference and he outlined what are three myths that are, that are stalling high school reform. The first myth is that setting higher standards and expectations will cause more students to fail and drive up the dropout rate. Haven't you heard this one? Yeah, it becomes more rigorous, you're gonna see more kids drop out. The second is that poverty is destiny. Some people claim that by the time students reach high school, it's too late, you know, they, it's too late to help them out. They have fallen so far behind and, you know, why spend the energy and the time? The third myth is that teachers and counselors cannot really prepare students for college and career because the concept of college and career readiness is too elusive. Some think that you can't measure college and career readiness nor track longitudinal data systems. That's one reason why our turnaround models are so valuable. And, and, and I can say, you know, sometimes you need the political cover to make some of the hard decisions. And that's where we believe our models were able to help many of you to, have, to provide that framework, that political cover, and we hope that flexibility, once you implement you know, the basic framework, to do the things that you knew, know will be effective with the students. And so when we look at what is effective, and I'm sure that this was part of the discussion in the last uh, couple of days, and, and here are a few of those elements that make success at the high school level uh, effective. Number one, you got to change, you got to move and have a cultural shift uh, that emphasizes respect and high expectations for all, coupled with a personalized, student-centered approach to teaching and learning. Number two, an emphasis on building professional learning communities based on clearly identified school and teacher student needs that includes a consensus about expectations to spur continuous improvement and support for teachers. Number three, a district-wide collaborative effort to reduce the dropout rate, get students who have dropped out back on track, raise graduation rates, and increase college readiness and enrollment. This community-wide focus includes engaging families and building broad partnerships with other PK-12 institutions as well as civic groups, social providers, and employers. This also means providing intensive and innovative support for students like extended learning time and credit recovery programs. It also means maintaining college preparatory focus for all students from high expectations like honors 
requirements for all students to dual enrollment options that allow students to earn college credit while still in high school. I always talk about a visit that I made to, um, to Texas, to, to the Valley in southern Texas, and I went out to visit some of the schools there. I'm Superintendent King. Amazing programs, amazing programs that follow these very elements. And if you haven't had a chance to look up some of his work, I encourage you to. As more schools implement these and other strategies for turnaround, we will be able to counter the dangerous myths about high school reform with demonstrated success. Today we have 407 high schools implementing a SIG model, serving more than 385,000 students. That means almost 50% of the schools across the country implementing a SIG turnaround are high schools. Each of you is helping to turn the tide for those students from helplessness and failure to hope and high expectations. Thank you for having the courage to step up to save our children from the tragedy of broken dreams. You are helping break cycles of poverty and failure and replace them with upward trends of ac academic, economic, and social success. You are providing what is possible to a school district and schools in terms of you haven't taken up this challenge, but you've, you've taken up this challenge and you are going to see it through. And you know what? We're here to help. And that's what's very important about the work that we do in the office, in the department. We know that this work requires a lot of courage, but capacity building in your states, districts, and schools in order to successfully do this work is a challenge. It's a challenge for all of us, including us at the federal level. But the challenge that we have is one that I believe through partnerships we can see them happen. In fact, today's conference is an example of that. As um, Joe mentioned, when I became Assistant Secretary, I knew, having come from the field, the importance of providing technical assistance and how important it is to have that support in implementing um, difficult reforms. In fact, we even have a little tagline uh, that we, we just uh, we had a contest in, in our office of elementary and secondary and one of the employees came up and we, uh, with, this, with this tagline and everyone voted. It's strong partnerships, successful students. Again, even at the federal level, we want to remember that our work is to support you so that you can ensure that students are successful. And so for us, being a part of these conferences with Joe and with the other directors is really important. It's really important for our work and to support you. This conference has been a wonderful platform for learning so far. You've already engaged in a number of important sessions on some of the important strategies for successful school turnarounds. From recruiting and retaining the best teachers and leaders at the high school level to improving literacy for adolescents, from implementing early warning systems to curb dropouts, and how best to support English language learners at the high school level. We know we don't have all the answers at the department, but what's important for us then is to serve as a convener so that you can learn from your colleagues and build those communities of practice that will keep the momentum going far beyond a single conference. Together, all the components of our technical assistance plan are geared to help states, districts, and schools secure the tools to ensure success. And we hope that you will continue to provide us with feedback on the resources you need to improve achievement for all of our schools and our students. Given the scope and the urgency of this message, I want to share with you uh, the four C's that I often share with the groups of reformers like yourself. And, I share these because they're the, um, the four C's of leadership. The first one is courage. You know, I know that each of you has to have the courage and it, because you wouldn't be sitting here because it is a very courageous thing to work on training around a high school and providing support for a high school. It is not easy. It is not easy to turn around a high school, and it takes courage to do the right thing for children. We must disrupt the status quo and press for equity and access, as well as for higher standards and expectations for all of our children. At the same time, we must constantly seek new ways to collaborate with a wide range of partners, our second C. Transformative, lasting change, as you know, 
depends on consens- consensus and support from the early learning community, the K-12 system, the post-secondary system, parent groups, teachers unions, business partners, and community-based organizations, if it's going to last. But even courage and collaboration aren't enough. We must build the capacity, our own capacity as leaders to do the work, as well as the capacity of the systems in which we exist. And the fourth C is that we must have relentless, relentless commitment to reform. We can't stop, even when it gets very, very difficult, and give up. We have to have that relentless commitment to our students. In the case of turnarounds, we must reframe reframe expectations to acknowledge that with the proper support, all students can succeed. Raising student achievement and graduation rates opens the door for students and strengthens communities. To be an education leader, and this is what I loved most when I was back in a school district, means waking up each morning knowing that you can forever, you can forever change the life of a child for the better. And to me, the goal of preparing students for the best, brightest, most fulfilling future provides all the inspiration needed to forge ahead. So I challenge you to take the four C's to heart. And as you go back to your school districts, to your states, that you really remember these four C's. Before I go, I'd like to step back and talk about the vision and the ultimate goal. You know, I've gone to a lot of SIG schools uh, across the country, and a question I always ask the school team is, what do you expect to see in five years? Describe to me what the school would look like from a children, from the child, from the youth's perspective, from the perspective of a teacher and the principal, the community. What will it look like? Not what activities were done or what structures were changed, but what will it look like? And you know, one school, one school that I went to, I saw it. I saw it in action. And this is a school in, in uh, Tacoma, Washington. And this school it was a school that uh, has been involved in the turnaround effort at high school for several years. And you see, one day, uh, Lincoln High School, it was uh, beginning of freshman year, uh, several years ago. They were looking at their, uh, excuse me, freshman They were looking at their freshmen. And they noticed that most of the students were really far behind. Um, they were far behind in their skills. They were, they were you know, just really far behind. And they realized that they needed to do something different. So they actually used one of our Smaller Learning Communities grant to, to get this, uh, this work off the ground. And what they did is that they researched and they found some of the best practices at traditional high schools. But they also went to charter high schools and looked at what they're doing, too. And they pulled together a model that sounds a lot like, you know, one of our SIG models. And so what they provide is an enrichment program with intensive academic support with an extended school day that amounts to about 540 additional hours of academic time a year for students. And what moved me the most, and as this is actually a picture as I went around the, the classroom visiting with, with the students, I went into this one classroom and I asked all the students, I said, um, how many of you plan to go to college? And, and this is a diverse high school with students, um, uh, majority, I think almost all the students were high poverty students. When I asked the question, how many of you plan to go to high school? Every single hand went up. Every single hand went up. That's the vision. That's the vision. And what it did for me, it affirmed in my heart what I strongly believe that all students can be successful if we hold them to high expectations, if we believe in them and we support them with their skills. They will be successful. They will be successful. There is no limit to a child's potential when they meet high expectations, a nurturing atmosphere, and excellent teaching. 
I want to close with, uh, and, and I, please forgive me if you've already heard this story, um, but this is a, this is a story that's um, a, a very personal story. When I was a fifth grader um, back in 1968, I had the amazing opportunity. I remember it was a Saturday. I waited all day long on the corner of Madison Avenue and 3rd Street. There was a lot there. There was you know, a lot. Later, a house was built there, but it's a lot. And I waited all day long with my sign because Senator Bobby Kennedy was going to drive by and shake people's hands because it was uh, during the primary for uh, the presidential election. And he was in California. And I don't, I don't know how he did it, but, I mean, he went... You know, neighborhood to neighborhood to neighborhood. And we're, uh, I lived in a suburb of Los Angeles uh, called Montebello. And there, you know, I waited all day with my sign. And finally, his car, his convertible, with his sleeves rolled up, drove by. I reached up and I actually shook his hand. I shook his hand. And I was so excited, you know, as a 10 year old. For me, it was a moment of, of innocence, of hope, of sort of an innocent type of hope, you know, a belief that, you know, things were going to change, you know, whatever a fifth grader thinks that is, you know. And then I was heartbroken when a few days later he was assassinated there in, in Los Angeles. But he always um, had an impact um, in my life, and there is a a quote that um, I've always loved and just recently when my parents came out uh, to visit about two months ago I went to Arlington Cemetery and uh, we went to his grave I mean you know how Latinos are I mean we love the Kennedys so you know <laughs> we go out to, uh, to Arlington and there it was uh, the quote that I've always always loved and I share this one with you because I hope it will inspire you as it's inspired me. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. These ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Your individual efforts the work that you do every single day, that work sets off a ripple of hope for our children. And I can see all those ripples of hope creating currents, creating strong and mighty currents that will change the way we work with students in public education and will open up opportunities for them like we've never seen before. So, I thank you. I thank you for the work that you do every day, for the ripples of hope that you send out, and I thank you to be a partner with you for this opportunity to change education here in the United States. Have a wonderful rest of the conference, and I wish you the best in your work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Melendez. I, I, well, I appreciate the acknowledgement of the, of the success of the conference and your gratitude. In all fairness, I want to thank many other members of the team who are really responsible for making this happen. Uh, Linda Miller, with Great Lakes, director of the Great Lakes uh, West Center. Barb Youngren, who uh, is the director of Great Lakes East and headed up the um, logistics team. And uh, Sabrina Lane, who's the director of the TQ Center. And most importantly, for all of us, I want to acknowledge our various center staffs. And if they're in the uh, audience, I'd like the members of any of those centers to stand up, including the high school center. I know you're in the back. I can see a lot of you. 